it's my great pleasure to introduce Ella Sharemi, who will be a familiar face to many of you from uh, BU. She got her PhD here in the Department of Political Science in 2017. Um, Ella <clears throat> was a very active participant in our African Studies program. Uh, when she came to the university, she was uh, my advisee, but uh, she heard the siren call of uh, political theory um, and took a very innovative approach to her education, combining uh, political theory with a comparative look at, at Africa. She wrote a fascinating PhD uh, looking at uh, the idea of the moral legitimacy of law in a particular context. So she took big political thinkers and tried to apply them in a particular place uh, in Nigeria um, and used experimental methods. It is one of the most innovative and most interesting uh, PhDs that I've ever uh, read or, or been part of. So uh, it is my great honor to uh, be able to welcome Ella back. Uh, since she left BU, um, she has been uh, based mostly in Europe. Uh, she was at the European University Institute in Italy, a Max Weber fellow. Um, she is now uh, in back home in Lagos, Nigeria, um, where you know, as all of us at the moment are sort of trapped wherever we ended up in March, um, she is there, but but luckily it's home for her. Um, I'm very excited to hear some new work from, from Ella. So let me turn it over to you and say thank you and what an honor it is to have you join us. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, right, let me come up. I am, yeah, like Tim was saying, I am stuck in, well, I'm not stuck. I'm happy to be home. I have been home in Lagos, Nigeria since March. Um, and we had come thinking that we would be heading back to Italy because my Max Faber Fellowship um, carries on through the end of this month, December, and we thought we would be back in Italy by July. And of course, uh, the world just laughed at our plans. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm in Lagos, but like Tim says, I'm based in Italy uh, professionally as a Max Faber Fellow at the EUI. And I actually um, go on to carry on as a visiting fellow um, at the, um, with the Max Faber program at the EUI from January next year until July. So I just want to start by um, really thanking uh, Professor Tim Longman, Professor Bustan, Eric Schmidt, and all the other organizers of the Walter Rodney seminars. seminars. Um, like Tim said, I'm not only a BU alumna, but I am an alumna of the African Studies Center, um, which was very much uh, an amazing home to me during my graduate studies. And I remember the Walt Rodneys being host to the kind of scholars that we hoped that we would become when we grew up. Um, and I'm pretty sure I haven't grown up yet, but suffice to say, I'm, I, I consider it just an immense honor to have been invited um, to speak today. Uh, so the, and also it doesn't help that I have Tim and Judith in, in, in the audience, so to speak. And I'm really glad that I actually can't see them. So yeah. The title of my talk is Freedom in the Political Thought of Steve Biko. And it's based on an article manuscript that I currently have in preparation for publication. Um, but before I get to the heart of my talk, I want to first situate some of my arguments for you within the existing literature in African political theory, as well as within some of the popular understanding of the, of the subject matter. And it, because I think this will help to clarify both what I conceive as one of the main challenges or problems within that scholarly literature and within that wider understanding, and which I see the interpretation that I have of Steve Vico as helping to clarify and also to clear some space, some room for what I think makes Vico's political thought inherently worthy of study, uh, particularly from a normative theoretical perspective. So the literature in African political theory in terms of the perspectives that are driving much contemporary work currently oscillates between at least two dominant streams. You have those who seem to be interested in carrying on the work of an older generation, let's say. And, and what that has tended to mean is delineating what counts as a specifically African political theory on the basis of what I, and I think quite a lot of others 
would, would, would think of as ethno-culturalist criteria. Now among these, and I'm not gonna mention any names because I don't have positive things to say about this cohort of, of work, um, but we have people who are focused on whether ideas can be treated as meeting the specification of having only been thought of by people who speak certain languages. So you get people talking about, for instance, you know, this is a this is an understanding or a set of values that is particular for Bantu speaking peoples um, of sub-Saharan Africa. And this is meant to give the reader the idea that everybody in Africa is a Bantu speaker, which is, I mean, we don't need to get into linguistic heritage to know that that's not true. Um, or, or who can trace their ethnic heritage to some line below the Sahara. So again, in that literature, you have people saying, you know, we're not going to count anyone from Northern Africa, or we're not going to count anyone from, you know, we're not going to count ideas. Not only are we not going to count anyone that, that is from Northern Africa, but we're not even going to count ideas that have substantive influence um, from outside the continent even if they also have substantive influence from inside the continent, just because that outside influence is taken to be uh, too definitive or too, to, uh, to outweigh the, the influence that is seen as coming from within Africa. So for me, it's not only, it's a very bizarre and fuzzy line of work. And, and I think it's also detrimental to the field. And hopefully I have a paper that's coming out on this in the not too distant future in the Journal of Contemporary African Studies. So among this cohort of theorists, analysis has tended to be concentrated on the subject of uh, a specifically African form of community or for some Ubuntu. And in such work, one often comes across this very ahistorical, analytically unspecific theorizing that can be loosely summarized in, in the following way. So, so the concept of Ubuntu or community is a specifically African one that not only underlies the socio-political and cultural arrangements, in many sub-Saharan African societies. It, it can further be fully juxtaposed to an opposite Western individualism, which in most cases is, is uh, the theorist attributes to a, a Kantian theoretical tradition. So we, the, the philosophical understandings that come from people like Jacob um, in Ethiopia, are discounted as not African enough. And somehow Kant has like, all the has bought all the um the copyright on individualism and nobody else is allowed to um to own it or use it now of course one is reminded of the great ali mazruri's essay on the concept of we are all africans in which he questions those who desperately seek some grandly uniform intellectual overlay that they can spread over the continent even while some of these do acknowledge the vastness of the continents ethno-linguistic varieties or the arbitrariness of the, of the lines that mark the continent out on man-made maps. Now, Mazruri says one possible answer that such folks might like is the one that says Africans at least have a negative common element in that they are like one to another to the extent that they are collectively different from anything in the outside world. For those of you familiar with the rest of Mazruri's essay, you'll know that he doesn't buy the simplisticness of such an answer. Um, and neither do I. There is then another species of work in African political theory at the moment that is being driven by a growing crop of what I personally consider to be bold young theorists. And into this group, I have, or about this group, I have a lot more positive things to say. So I'm gonna name names and they include Adam Getachew, Uchena Okeja, who is um, at the University of Rhodes in South Africa. Adam is at University of Chicago uh, and Jane Anna Gordon, who I think is at Connecticut and, 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 and a lot many more. And these theorists don't see the African geography as a means of, or purely as a means of categorizing or organizing intellectual thought, but as a category itself to be interrogated. And one of the most refreshing things about this strand of theorizing is that it cares really very little about the traditions in Anglo-American or European political thought, not because it thinks that they are unimportant, it just doesn't see them as a necessary means of juxtaposition, the work that they are doing, juxtaposing the work that they're doing in African political theory. Um, and, and, and the view is that these are traditions that already have a lot of the world's attention and the ones that don't are the ones that need our, our focus and our analysis. 
So they care not about how theoretical analyses that spring from African historical or geographical contexts measure up to Europe, Euro-American traditions, and they don't really care about how uh, they might be similar to or different from Euro-American tradition, Euro traditions. Um, and if Euro-American traditions happen to be in their analytical sites, especially the ones um, that are problematic, it is often to examine what is wrong with them in their inability to speak to and for so much of the rest of the world and how they could be corrected to make them less parochial. So this is all to say that the second strain theorizes with historical, conceptual and geographic specificity and treats the ideas that emerge from African spaces for their own sake. So what has Steve Biko to do with all of this? The rest of my talk will aim to answer this in two parts. First, I want to get the interpretation I have, I want to get into what interpretation I have of freedom in Biko's thought, um, what it tells us about both his conception of community and its relation to the individual and how this can help us face some of the fuzzier theorizing that goes on in the older first strand of work in the literature. Secondly, following in the vein of the second strand of the work in the literature that I've just described, I think means taking Biko for his own sake and not because he fits into or does not fit into some more dominant so-called hegemonic intellectual tradition. For instance, continental existentialism, which is the box that he is categorized by the few people who do work on him from a normative theoretical perspective. And even when the work that is our focus is not yet taken so very seriously by political theory in general. Now, for me, the necessary corollary of all this is that we must also properly interrogate Biko, but on his own terms. So let me get started. Most of my primary resources uh, come from Biko's speeches and interviews, and this perhaps explains why Biko isn't taken seriously as a political thinker and as someone whose ideas are useful and transferable to spaces and times beyond his own. And he tends to be thought of only as a political activist. This is the case certainly when we compare him to those such as Fanon, for example, where not only the availability of multiple first person written texts has made the latter more accessible to mainstream political theory and political philosophy, but also the fact that Fanon himself situates his own ideas within a conversation whose participants are familiar as serious enough to political theory or general political theory to allow for Fanon's own acceptability. So most notably we have Sartre, but of course de Beauvoir and Camus and a number of others. Now in Biko's case, we don't have much of either of these factors, but since the task, or at least I see it as my task to take him seriously on his own terms, then I don't particularly have a problem with that. Biko's immediate concern is the situation of black South Africans under apartheid. And this makes him concerned with freedom in a more immediate sense, but he's also concerned more broadly with the nature of humanity. And in particular with the notion of what is fundamentally at the root of the South African problem. For him, this is an issue that has in fact local context because it has a universal one as well. So Biko frames this issue as a problem of superiority or what I have tried in the paper to term a, a super, a notion of superhumanity, which is a notion that is always only made possible by the existence of any group whose own humanity has ceased to be informed by or rooted in communally sustained regenerative identities, i.e humanities that come to be enslavable. And I will explain this point about uh, an enslavable humanity a little bit later. So for Biko, the community is necessary because it is needed to sustain and in times of crisis regenerate in the individual's humanity. The notion of the community as existing not in tandem as the individual, but ahead of her and even over her, doesn't seem to exist for Biko. And so freedom becomes the product of an interactive effort, in, of an interactive effort, sorry, just as genuine humanity is the result for Biko only of a particular kind of balance. So this is the first major development that I make of Biko's ideas. And it is one that takes him firmly out of any attempt 
to situate him within a continental existentialism. The claim that if we are to think of Biko's intellectual contributions as fundamentally philosophical or normatively applicable in nature, we have to situate him among the existentialist, among the existentialists is I think based on two main factors. The first one to me is not particularly essential. And so I'm only gonna mention it without going into much further detail about it. And the second is I think based on a reading uh, and a listening to of Biko that does not have quite enough depth. The first is that Biko's ideas were influenced by Fanon, himself categorized as an existentialist thinker. Certainly it's true that some of Fanon's ideas influenced some of Biko's, okay. The second factor that has made some want to categorize Biko as an, exist as an existentialist, and which I think is more intellectually interesting, is the notion that because Biko's thoughts were very much grounded in the immediate reality of apartheid South Africa, and his mental labors were focused on securing a very real, very non-theoretical freedom for Black South Africans, he was not also concerned with a more universally applicable theoretical understanding of freedom, of humanity and of morality, or that at the very least, somehow his words could not be interpreted to be so applicable. This conclusion is I think informed by a shallow interpretation of him. I, I certainly don't deny that Biko was concerned with the now of his time and context. This is, this is obvious, but when Biko says, and I, I quote, we do not believe in minority rights because guaranteeing minority rights implies division of the community on a race basis. We believe that in our country, there shall be no minority, there shall just be people. It seems to me that Biko is not only talking about the particular context of apartheid South Africa, he's further espousing an understanding of freedom that includes and informs his immediate circumstances. But also, goes very much philosophically beyond it. So let's get into Biko's conception of freedom. There are two elements, a negative one and a positive one. By negative, we mean the removal of some force or action by one person or set of persons or things over the sphere of action of another. And by positive, we mean to describe what is actually required to fill in a person's domain of free action. So Biko's understanding of freedom most prominently contains the negative element and the clearest part of his conception of freedom is when he speaks of freedom as non-domination. But his understanding also contains a theoretical conception of positive freedom. And this is special because it is in his conception of positive freedom that we get further into Biko's use of community and which allows us to challenge some of the prevalent historical, ahistorical conceptions of African community or Ubuntu um, in which community is seen as some kind of overriding structure in most, if not all African societies and leads us to such un unprovable claims and proclamations about how individualism has no place in some stagnant notion of the traditional African society. So for Biko, at least, community does not perform in this way. It has a specific utility, particularly in times of crises which not only which only does not um, which not only does not and cannot logically subordinate the individual but further takes its own force and utility from the extent to which it enables the individual to tr to thrive that is to be positively free so let me clarify one thing it, it's not that i don't think uh, biko's conception of negative freedom is theoretically interesting this is certainly not the case because it is in his conception of freedom as non-domination that I interpret him to be talking about what he conceives to be the nature of a true humanity that is not predicated on the facing or the physical and moral subjugation of one set of human beings to another. But his ideas in this vein, I think, are somewhat better understood. And they are, I think what informs much of the popular understanding and imagination of Biko's thoughts. So for instance, Biko's understanding of freedom as non-domination comes through when he says, I, and I begin a quote, freedom is the ability to define oneself, oneself with one's possibilities held back, not by the power of other people over one, but only by one's relationship to God and to natural surroundings. And again, when he says, the black consciousness approach would be irrelevant in a colorless, non-exploitative egalitarian society. And to be really clear to those who were trying very hard at the time to misunderstand him, he says, 
the black man has got no ill intentions for the white man. The black man is only incensed at the white man to the extent that he wants to entrench himself in a position of power to exploit the black man. So freedom understood as non-domination is what also explains Biko's stringent opposition to the notion of integration. He writes, the concept of integration whose virtues are often extolled in white liberal circles is full of unquestioned assumptions that embrace white values. And by white values, he means the values of exploitation and oppression. Biko continues, it, integration, is a concept long defined by whites and never examined by blacks. It is based on the assumption that all is well with the system apart from some degree of mismanagement by irrational conservatives at the top. So even without the North American context, most of, our, most of us are, I think, familiar with some of this. But what is, I think, interesting about the non-domination aspect of how Biko conceives of freedom is the notion that enslavement or structural oppression does not just involve the subjugation of one man or to another. The very act of subjugation for Biko disturbs a natural balance. In other words, we have taken something from one place and actively put it in another place where it does not belong. The humanity of the enslaved comes to be added to the existing humanity of the enslaver to make something that was not supposed to exist. A human being who is now able to act as if he or she is more than merely one. So to me, this interpretation is what makes a specifically Bikoan Black consciousness a little bit different even than the way that term has come to be deployed uh, by, by some section, sections of society today. Biko was concerned with writing a moral imbalance. The idea was not by, by my interpretation simply to elevate Black South Africans within a system that was organized to ensure and maintain the gross exploitation of some group, it was rather to return everybody to an original line. The entire organizing structure and most importantly, the existing norms that perpetuated that structure would need to be dismantled because it requires not only the elevation of one group, the previously subjugated group, Restoring balance further needs another group to come back down. And that coming down was also to be as much a liberation from domination of the dominating group as for the subjugated group. So it's a double action with an interconnected yet separate focus. Now in the concrete South African case, the emancipation of black Africans needed to happen alongside the liberation of white South Africans who by their own structural exploitation had implemented an imbalance in which they also had now become morally constrained. They would need to bring themselves back down so that they were no longer more than just human beings. So I want to take the last half of a quote, which the beginning of which I will fill in for you as we move further along in my argument. And it is this, Equally too, in order to be able to listen to blacks, the whites needed to defeat the one problem which they had, which was superiority. That's the end of that quote. To give you a slightly different angle on a quote that I've already mentioned, this is what I also read to the fuller meaning when Biko says, we do not believe in the so-called guarantees of minority rights. We believe that in our country, there shall be no minority. There shall be no majority. There shall be just people it will be a completely non-racial egalitarian society. Biko isn't talking about numbers. He means conceptually, ethically, normatively. He's clearer himself than I could ever be. So let's take this. White society is quite agreed that blacks have to come up. A lot of them don't see that this entails them coming down and this is the problem. So he's not asking for a so-called fair share of an existing pie. He's asking that we reconceive the pie so that the conception of superiority and in his particular case, at least on a racialized basis and inferiority does not exist. In fact, to put it plainly, he wants the pie completely destroyed. If Biko's conception of freedom as non-domination is undeniably interesting, his conception of positive freedom is to me quite special. And this is so for two reasons. The first is that regardless of what tradition one is looking at, especially in this part of the world, although now that I'm speaking from Lagos, that sentence doesn't make sense, in your part of the world, there really are very few conceptions of positive freedom. And so Biko stands among quite a unique few. 
And when we consider that many notions of positive freedom are then also logically infeasible because they tend to go too far in elaborating the sphere of the individual's free action, that it becomes unclear how we could all ever live in, in one single society. So we see how special Biko's conception is for being morally coherent, at least to certain degrees. Second, the substance of Biko's conception of positive freedom is where we find the normative resources to deal with some of the issues that loom large in the existing literature in African political theory, i.e. the relationship in African spaces between the community and the individual. So Biko doesn't expressly use the term positive freedom. It is clear, but it is clear that there is another element to a distinctly Bicoan understanding of freedom that involves an affirmative element. This is the part that comes through when Biko talks about what is needed to properly secure the emancipation of Black South Africans. Because for him, simply getting white people to stop oppressing Black people is only one small part of the freedom equation for both Black and white South Africans. And he says, to kill the idea that one kind of man is superior to another kind of man requires action, that is a positive agency. In understanding, this is consciousness. In the particular South African case, this is black consciousness, a concrete understanding and cultivation of black pride, history and culture. The purpose of which was the reinstating of black freedom, which is a positive agency. So freedom for Biko is not simply the removal of a, negative force, of a negative force, which in any case does not amount to more than rolling back of a negative action. It requires further constructive construction, so to speak, on the part of those who seek or aspire to be free. And this is so for the simple reason that for Biko, freedom and the power actively contained in it was not something that one man could, however benevolently, give over to another. We have each to fill it in ourselves, no matter if, how, or who took it from us in the first place. So Biko is clear about this, that even in the best of worlds, the oppressor cannot give the oppressed back their freedom, not in the truest sense, not if we understand freedom as ever moving action. I think this is what Biko means when he says for his own specific context, that while it is the business of white liberals to oppose what is wrong, it is not, however, their business either to determine for black people the means through which the latter would oppose the system of their oppression, nor is it their business to lead that opposition. Now, I want to get a little bit into that just because in current times, that is taken a slightly different way than how I, I interpret it. Some read this as Biko's stance against the appropriation of racial struggle by the racializing group. So yeah, in a shallow sense, it certainly was this. But if we listen to what Biko says, even about the specific historical context that brought him to this conclusion, we see that he means something a little bit deeper and more globalizing than this. And so in a 1977 interview, he's describing the situation that led him and, and a number of others to developing the Black Consciousness Movement. And he says, there was no participation by Blacks in the articulation of their own aspirations. The whole opposition to what the government was doing to Blacks came in fact from white organizations. There was some kind of anomaly in this situation where whites were in fact the main participants in our oppression and at the same time the main participants in the opposition to our oppression. He goes on. It implies that at no stage in this country were Blacks throwing in their lot in the shift of political opinion. We argue that any changes which are to come can only come as the result of a program worked out by Black people. And for Black people to work out a program, they need to defeat the one main element in politics, which was working against them, as this was a psychological feeling of inferiority, which was deliberately cultivated by the system. So this is the first half of the quote. I gave a few minutes ago about the problem of white superiority being a hill off of which it was up to whites themselves to figure out how to be emancipated from. So if Biko is against the impropriety of white people being at the forefront of a struggle that has only been fueled by their very own ascendance, this is not to me his most substantive complaint so far as the genuine freedom of black people in South Africa is concerned. Indeed, I read him as making a deeper statement about the very moral impossibility of one man 
filling in the dimensions of another man's freedom and the moral necessity of action on the part of she who aims to be free. I think one of the reasons why this aspect of his understanding of freedom is not as clear as his understanding of freedom as non-domination, so his understanding of negative freedom, is to do with the fact that for his own particular context, he is focused exclusively on the freedom of Black people, and he is as such easily read as always coming to a conclusion in which the major part of what is involved in this freedom is simply offloading the oppressive systems built by white South Africans, or that the main aim of Black consciousness is in this negative sense, simply the removal or undoing of the white man's gaze a la Fanon. This reading is, I think, understandable, but I think it's also slightly flawed. Precisely one of the reasons that Biko is and cannot be focused on the positive action required to free whites in the more true positive sense is because he does not believe it is his business. It is not something that he or anybody else is morally capable of doing for another man. It is something other those men individually and communally must do for themselves. It is simply another historical irony that this particular enslavement from which whites in South Africa must be untangled has more percept perceptibly been done by their own hands. So let me move on. What does Biko actually mean by freedom in the more positive sense then? For him, it describes an historically minded engagement that weds the community to the individual and vice versa. And by historically minded, I mean history with a capital H. That is a conception in which the past, the present and the future are not only inextricably intertwined, but exist simultaneously. Now this comes through from the number of times Biko uses the word aspirations, not merely as defining what black South Africans were aiming for, uh, at, were aiming for in and by their freedom, but also as defining the educative background that would be made to inform in the present these aspirational futures. Those who were exclusively interested in some stagnant view of African tradition or culture would have to look elsewhere. He says this when, he's talk, when he talks of the ways in which progress in South Africa must be predicated on black South Africans themselves having to be open to change and to learning to see and do things in the world in new ways. Now, this is not new because these things were not original or seen before in, in the cultural histories of Black South Africans, but they are new or they are going to be new because they wouldn't be no, Black South Africans would no longer be afraid to use them. This is, uh, and that is to use them and make them active rather than to have them as passive cultural understandings to be proactively re-educated by them and to be made bold in them. So he explains of his, his particular context that there is the need for the black man to elevate his own position by positively looking at those very systems that make him distinctly a man in society. For Biko's specific aspect, this means reinstating and redrawing from the systemic cultural forms that enabled not simply the removal of a European cultural dominance within the South African geographical space, but the recentering of the communal and individual memory that Black South Africans had, and which made them men for their own sakes and not for the perpetual servitude of others. For Biko, this positive aspect of freedom was to be an affirmative action on both the individual and communal self by both the individual and communal self. Positive freedom for Biko involves a conscious communal and individual engagement, since for him, the individual was unfree to the same degree as was her entire community. And the deadlock also worked in the other direction. So positive freedom had to be about a cultural, political and social liberation that would see the subjugated come to regain their belief in themselves as complete beings. For this, the individual had to take seriously her responsibility towards her community in every discernible aspect. But the community itself was also only useful to the extent that it was able to provide these very sources of psychological liberation for the individual. The community had to be able to provide to the individual the resources that she would need to become unafraid of intellectual change and reformulation. 
to the extent that the community was not able to provide such resources because for instance, it had been made momentarily weak due to a period of trauma, then individuals had the responsibility of revitalizing her, but not for the purpose of being blanketly subjected to that community as some unimpeachable organizing principle, but precisely to be able to draw and redraw authentically individually from her yet again. In fact, for Biko, if the community is not providing and dedicated to providing for the individual the psychological resources to give each justifiable member a strength that makes her unafraid, that is unsubjugatable, this is not a word, but you understand what I mean, unenslavable in the setting of her own agenda in a traumatizing world, then the community is useless and indeed in need of being reformulated and reimagined. So let me now return to this notion of enslavable, enslavable humanities, which I mentioned close to the beginning of the talk. Biko is, I think, a little bit obsessed by this notion. Um, and he repeats the question multiple times. So I wanted to, to try and understand what it is about this notion that getting to him. And this is the question that he, 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 you hear him ask over and over again. He says, what is it in him, that is the black man, that is lending him to denigration so easily? And then you have the sentiment of this question contained again in perhaps one of Biko's most famous speeches, where he says an, in an abbreviated quote that the black consciousness movement is a response to the realization of the need for black people to rid themselves of the shackles that bind them to perpetual servitude. Now we can take this question and this sentiment in at least a couple of ways. Does Biko think that there is something inherent in black people that makes us essentially enslavable? Um, I, and I don't think the use of the word denigrate in Biko's question is coincidental. In other words, is it part of our makeup to somehow always be the N word? The answer I hope obviously is no. And Biko obviously does not think that either. He speaks of us as the purposeful making of God. Um, so what is he talking about? I think he's talking about the identities from which we have been left to draw an innate strength. These from hit for him have first been dislodged and then replaced by cultural identities that are not ours. And he talks about the major problem in the South African, in the South Africa of his own time, being one of a European island having been superimposed in the middle of the country. But let us also be clear Biko is different from Fanon in this regard. He does not claim that the European identity is not ours simply because it practically comes from men who do not appear to look like us or who are not us. He thinks it's not ours because we have not positively contributed to making it. So here is Biko's conception of freedom, which is the inextricably linked other half to his conception of freedom as non-domination. It is a conception of positive freedom that makes dependency, that is between the individual and the community and vice versa, the center of its logical framework. Contrary to the longstanding theoretical understanding of a so-called African community or like a singular African community, what Biko is espousing is a notion in which not only does the individual not live for the sake of the community, it is the community that lives for the sake of the individual. The resources that we pour into the community are, in the end, for the purpose of our own individual, cultural, psychological, emotional, and moral sustenance. Now, if I was interested to compare Biko's understanding to a number of understandings of positive freedom in the Anglo-American tradition, for example, I would say that, to me, this seems like quite an analytical, rad analytically radical understanding. But since I'm not interested, I won't say that. So we're getting close to the end of my talk. Um, there are two intertwined tracks on which I want to interrogate and problematize Biko's own notions before we get there. The first <clears throat> is the fact that as it stands, his understanding of positive freedom is predicated on a counterpart understanding of closed communities. This is, I think, for the purposes of a morally coherent logic, problematic. We don't have to live in racialized societies to comprehend the problem. Any society that contains more than one moral tradition, particularly if this moral tradition happens to be further cemented along lines of discernibly distinct socio-cultural histories, 
can comprehend this problem. In other words, there's no society in which only one single moral community exists. If it's not my business to fill in the lines of freedom for those who belong in some way to moral traditions or social cultural histories that I cannot or do not want to reasonably claim as my own, or if I remove power from their freedom when I make it my business, then how is it possible for us all to be free equally and at the same time? Bearing in mind that genuine equality presupposes transfer transferability in the most important aspects. In other words, is it possible? Is it even desirable for communities within any single society? And to really see that the problem is not like some abstract supposition, but is in fact a currently operating problem you can enlarge this to take in the whole world as a single human society. So is it normatively desirable to have morally parallel communities of free persons? And in such a case where our moral freedoms are seen as hinging upon the particularized resources of individual moral communities in being non-transferable, is this a real equality of freedom? If we have if we are to have a theory that is truly just or has in mind truly just societies, then Biko's notions will, I think, have to be made or developed to meet this challenge. The second inseparable problem is Biko's understanding that all Black people must essentially see themselves as coming from a single social cultural history. Excuse me. So he put it this way in his own words. All Blacks must sit as one big unit and no fragmentation and distraction from the mainstream of events can be allowed. Sounds like my government. This is also emphasized by Biko's use of what he calls African religion, which is something he envisages as existing prior to Christianity in African spaces and about which he says that the Africans also like Christians worshiped one God, but we did not just worship him on a single day like the Christians. Now, speaking as a Yoruba person who takes at least some of her moral resources from Yoruba religious practice and belief, I can tell you that at least for the Yoruba, this is not true. We have multiple male and female gods. And I think, but I think this attempt to cast a homogeneously grounded community for the group, however defined, is Biko's solution to both the normative problem that I've just elaborated and to the practical problem of his own day where the black leaders of what were then called the Bantustans were performing along ethnic lines. Biko's response to this, to, to this Bantustan leadership is condemnation. He says, we see all the so-called Bantustan platforms as being deliberate creations of the national government to contain the political aspiration of the black people and to give them pseudo-political pseudo platforms to direct their attentions. So it's perhaps that this attempt to homogenize a so-called African culture or community is with respect to Black South Africa in particular, but there's enough evidence in, in Biko's writings and, and, and what he says to suggest that he's not just talking about Black South Africa as the homo homogenous cultural and moral resource, but about the entire continent. Now, even in South Africa, the question still emerges whether the distinctions between the multiple cultural heritages of that particular African space are not meaningful enough to require our protection. Now, when you cover the entire continent, the problem becomes all the more acute. So let me elaborate the full-sided double problem. Equalized freedom requires the positive generation of identities that contribute to unenslavable humanities whose psychological resources are drawn from the moral communities of distinctly identified groups. The communities in turn retain their moral utility and integrity to the extent to which they sustain free individual identities in the present, the past, and the future. To contain moral power, however, these communities must be distinct enough to hold, sustain, and be sustained by those justifiably belonging to the group, but they must be big and generalizable enough also to prevent the fragmentation of that group along unessential or culturally superficial lines. However, at least some of the lines that exist between communities, even within the same or similar enough broad group are morally meaningful, meaning that without them, we lose at least some of the moral significance to be drawn from particularist identities in creating unenslavable humanities. But to generate a truly equal positive freedom, 
we are required not to see ourselves as belonging to distinctly separate moral communities into which we cannot all step. In other words, for the thing to work, drawing in the lines of your freedom has to be my business, just as developing the lines of my own freedom has to be your business. There are other issues that stem from the economic socialism in which Biko situates his thoughts and which speak to the assumption, <coughs> excuse me, that all inequalities, particularly those that appear to be practically registered in society through economic and or productive means are always man-made and never born of nature. But this is not a problem that is particular to Biko, but rather faces economic socialist thought in general. So I won't go into that here. Now, I don't believe that the main interrogation I have elaborated is sufficient to kill a Bikoan understanding of freedom. I think it can be resolved and even used to further develop Biko's own ideas. And one of those ways is to separate and draw out the lines between a wide moral community as one into which we can all be situated and more concrete and discreet and discreet socio-cultural and political communities from which each respective individual draws their power and in which membership is exclusive. But we still have a problem, which is how to answer the question of which ideas from which distinct socio-cultural communities are permitted into the larger moral community and which ones are made to determine the genuine equality of our freedom. Perhaps it's too easy to say that it should be the ones that apply to each of us without qualification. Because if it were that simple, then Biko and many others would not have had to exist in the form that they did. But the issue, I guess, is that because it's not simple, does not mean it's not true. So that's the end. I've come to the end of my talk. I will, I don't know how Tim and Eric want to. Thank you so much, Ella. So yeah, if, um, if anyone would like to um, ask some questions or, or provide comments, um, you can either use the raise hand feature on the bottom of your screen or, um, uh, or type a question in the Q&A box. And I see Tim is literally raising his hand. So let me uh, see if he has yeah. something to say first. <clears throat> thank you. I'll start out with just thank thank you, Ella. That was fantastic. And, it, and it's lovely to see your, uh, your uh, thinking moving in, in related but new directions. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment, and, and you're, you're welcome to throw this out if, it's, if, if you don't feel comfortable answering it, but, but I'm wondering if you could comment about the lasting impact of Steve Biko's thought, um, whether in South Africa or, or across the African continent, because um, he's certainly someone who's become iconic. Um, you know, it's a name that uh, people know of, even if they don't know that much about Africa, um, within the sort of pantheon of, of uh, African saints you know, Biko is up there with Lumumba and, and a few others. Um, and I'm just curious, um, because you're, you're critiquing some of what he's saying, but, but, it, but it, you know, it also seems, uh, just, just to give context today, I, I'm working on a book on, on church and state in Africa, and I was writing today about um, churches and the anti-apartheid movement. And, and clearly some of Biko's thinking and the activism that was related to it helped to create the space for churches to then step in and do some organizing against apartheid. So I'm curious whether more broadly you, you have a sense of, of what impact Biko's thinking has had. Um. Yeah, great question. I mean, so it's really hard working on somebody who isn't properly dead. <laughs> Yeah, so, but, you know, because, yes, okay, his body isn't here, but he very, he's very much alive in the popular imagination, certainly in Africa. I, I can't say that he's that alive outside of socialist, distinctly socialist circles outside of Africa, because I know in political theory, for instance, he's really not taken very seriously um, as like a serious um, thinker who we should question philosophically. Um, and, and his, his power there is amongst, you know, like a small group of cool, liberal, young socialists kind of thing. Um, but in Africa, he, he, he very much lives, like you say. The problem is, one problem that I have with the popular imagination of Biko, which I hope comes a little bit through in some of what I said, is that there's a real attempt 
to group him with Fanon in a way that I don't think I think we're having a little bit of lag. Yeah, yeah I can never tell whether that's me or the person who's talking when. No, I think it's uh, Ella. In this case. The connection held strong for. Um, throughout the talk. Throughout the talk, so that's good. So hopefully she'll reconnect here in a second. Um, and again, if you have if you have questions. Uh, oh, you're back, Ella. Yeah. You cut off as you were just saying that um, that that people are, are unhelpfully putting to get together Biko and Fennel. Yeah. So what I was saying was that you know I don't want to go too much in into Fanon because I'm not nearly my work isn't on him, so I have not got that deep into him. But what I do know is that Biko is not Fanon, and the ways in which they are different are so important. Um, and and useful in elaborating a specifically current understanding of pretty much anything that he was talking about so for instance you know to go back to your question in africa we have in or in lots of african spaces especially in south africa we have a celebration of biko as somebody who um you know is is at the forefront of the black consciousness movement is is elaborating an understanding of uh, a genuinely black cultural pride but because it's so grouped with fanon that is interpreted as this kind of it's still very much about the white gaze right like we are we are developing our own cultural understandings you know just because there is this there is this european force that is making us less black than we should be or whatever which is not big that's that's fanon that's not biko biko's understanding is that we are doing this because we need the resources to become whole to become um to, to, to become the same as everybody else not because we are better than anybody or whatever it is but also um to how should i put it to be able to sustain and regenerate ourselves in ways that are morally comprehensible in 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 a in a in an in a in, a, in, a, in a historical dimension um so i mean that's what i would say is that sure he's super alive but i think he's also super misunderstood yeah eric i saw we had at least one hand raised yeah uh, so we have a, a Monty McMurtry, if you'd like to um, ask your question, you should be able to unmute yourself now. And then uh, we have a question in the Q&A box after that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Monty McMurtry calling from Toronto, Canada. Uh, I spend a great deal of time in Africa and hopefully we'll be back in Congo in January. My question comment to you is I totally agree with your response to the first question in terms of how does one situate Biko because he has not published in a sense setting out his argument and the cross pollination with Fanon because Fanon was very strong at that period in time as with Lumbumba in terms of the the passion nationalism and Lumumba lacked intellectual rigor as well and, and Biko tragically passed away through external force. So he has not yet been well situated, save for attenuation by now external individuals. And I suspect what you're trying to do, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you are attempting to place Biko within an element of critical intellectual rigor in parsing what he actually thought at that time and perhaps as to how his thought has evolved and has been say taken by other people for their own personal use not to denigrate Biko but in terms of nationalism pan-nationalism autonomy and now in terms of what is happening in South Africa that the ANC which at one point 
was uh, an articulation of those dispossessed have become the new status quo oligarchy, extremely corrupt and venal, and now no longer listening or participating with those people who are lacking voice. And I just ask for your comments and I applaud what it is you're doing because you are advancing the intellectual conversation of an individual who needs truly to be placed in, in terms of virtue reality within scaffolding rigorous. I thank you. Yeah, um, I don't know. Do you want me to take each comment at once or is there a group? Okay, yeah, I mean, so one of the really, I'm gonna say great things because it's the field that I've chosen, but one of the and other, other fields, even within political science, but certainly outside political science, think it's ridiculous that political theorists are able to do this. But it's to be able to focus on um, the normative understandings of things without caring about the nece necessarily caring about the, the more practical dimensions of what is going on. So, and in this paper, I'm doing something a little bit different than I'm used to because I'm trying to take, like you say, I'm trying to be cognizant of, and, and I can't do it without being cognizant of because of the, the, the subject of being cognizant of the historical context. But one of the things that I am not doing is using other people's um, everyday interpretations of Biko. So there's a, there's a couple of um, Biko papers that are in African political theory. There's not very, he's not, he's not worked on very much even within African political theory. Um, and those papers that exist look, look at him sparingly, but then use most, most of their resources are second, secondary sources, their second literature sources. So like you're saying, other people's interpretations of him or how other people understand his, um, his ideas. And what I have tried to do in this is to really just focus on his speeches, on his one first person written text, which is I write what I like, um, and to piece together as much of his ideas as possible and to, to use my own interpretation to develop what I think are his ideas because it becomes very tricky to, if I'm using other people's interpretations of his ideas. Sure, like I use secondary literature to whatever, but, but the bulk of this is focusing on what I think, what I, uh, are words that he either written by him or spoken from his, um, spoken by him. Um, and I was saying to somebody the other day as I was work developing on the paper that this is like getting to the stage of like a Hegel Kojev thing. I don't know, this is only funny to political theorists because it's so sad. But, you know, Hegel Kojev is, it's very hard to tell which one is Hegel and which one is Kojev because the interpreter's voice is so loud. Um, and I feel that this is, it's getting to that point where I'm developing him so much and it's going to be a case of who's, who's talking, is it her or is it Biko? But I think that is just the consequence of there being just not enough primary text to work off. Um, I don't know, sorry, there were other parts to your comment about the more practical elements um, as they operate in uh, operating in South Africa, and I'm not sure that I caught that. Um, but I hope that gets to some of what you're saying, which is, I mean, I, I just think that it's really, really important. He's just, he's just not somebody that I think we really understand as well as we think we understand. Um, one, because like I said, uh, in answer to Tim's question, he's not, he's not dead, dead yet. Um, and so, you know, the, the water isn't cold over his ideas to be able to just pick at them and say, this is exactly what this means. And so he's continually reinterpreted um, in the present day by people who um, are not, are not ill-meaning. They're, they're definitely using his, his thoughts and ideas in ways that they think are authentic and true to him. I obviously disagree. Um, and so I think it's really important to develop him in ways 
um, that makes him somebody that, that we do go to in a canonical way. The other thing is I think that it's, and, and this is why I started off by giving um, some of the outlay of the perspectives that are currently employed as I see it in African political theory. It's so important to interrogate him. Um, and I think that isn't done very often um, in, in, in the public imagination because he is this figure of, um, of you know, a, a freedom fighter and, and someone who did such amazing things practically um, and for so many people, he is not interrogated, um, at, you know, if, if, if at all, um, because, you know, for those reasons, but it's so important to interrogate him because I think you don't get to, you don't get to have, you might understand his ideas, but they don't come to be really useful to us if we leave them and if we let the inconsistencies slide. Um, and, and then we do him a disservice uh, by not developing his ideas in ways that are morally coherent and, and usable for, for posterity's sake. Thank you. So the um, next question we have here is uh, in the, the Q&A box here from Ethan Key, one of our graduate students in history here. Um, I think you can read uh, this question here, um, Ella, but it seems like Biko is making some points of liberation for the oppressed and for the oppressor in a really powerful way that may provide parallels for giving land back and paying reparations in terms of US settler colonialism. It also seems his ideas would have some resonance for the relation of the global north and global south. How would Biko um, talking about white South Africans compare with someone like Cabral referring to the need for the petty uh, bourgeoisie to commit class suicide in Guinea-Bissau? I was also going to ask if he is also relating his ideas to different um, ethno-linguistic or nationality groups, but I think you may be covering that in terms of the Bantustans in South Africa. Um, would his idea of emphasizing um, commonalities of African religion and philosophy relate to um, John Beatty's work? That's not in that question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll take as many parts of it as I can. I mean, so the, mm, I don't want to get into arguments about reparations um, and the paying or non-paying of reparations in, in, especially in the US context for, for two reasons. One, I don't think it is part of Biko's agenda. Two, I don't think it is, and, and I've, I've become quite clear about this. I, I've given some interviews in a few, uh, the recent times where people have asked me this question, and I think it's responsible for me to say that I, I don't deserve to have a voice in that matter. It is, it is for African-Americans and Americans in America to have that discussion. And I think other people who contribute their voice to it have to do it in ways that are incredibly responsible. And if you're not able to do that, you shouldn't say anything. So I'm not going to say anything. Um, the, um, the question of the, the resonance, Global North and Global South, yeah, like for sh huge, huge resonance and huge, um, but still one of the things that I really want to try and do with this paper and and I and I don't know if it's possible to work out is I want to make it really clear that Biko's ideas are so one of the reasons they're brilliant is that they are universally applicable even when we're not talking about racialized societies and when we're not talking about colonial imbalance societies. Like they're obviously applicable there, right? We, we can see that that's really obvious, but the ways in which they're applicable are so much wider than that, right? Like he is talking about things that are that are applied to you regardless of whether or not you are in a country that has been colonized or whether or not you're in a country um, that is built off the back of slavery and the slave trade. Um, his own particular South African experience means that the, the, the primary locus is this discussion between black and white and between um, slave and enslaved. And, and, but the, 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 the features that go into those things are things that apply to every single one of us. Um, and the, the, to me, what is the, the, 
what is so interesting about trying to elaborate that understanding is figuring out when he's talking about, for instance, the, so he uses this term and I refer to it that in South Africa, it comes to be like, there is a European island in the middle of South Africa. And I'm not gonna quote word for word, um, but there is, and trust me, I've listened to his speeches about a hundred times and just like reciting them like a lunatic. But there is, you know, he goes, there is a European island in the middle of South Africa. And it comes to be that when visitors come to this place, they never see a black man not in a subservient role. They never see, um, they never see him in his full weight as a man. And I'm thinking, what does this guy mean here? Because he's not, one of the things that is so fascinating about him is that he says a sentence and you think, oh, I get that. Like, I, like he's obviously just talking about black people and white people. And, and then he says another sentence like, oh no, he's talking about something much, much deeper. And, and I'm thinking, what does he really mean by this? And for me, he is talking about what it takes for every person to be fully the being that God created them to be. Whether that means you look like me or you look like Tim and Eric or whatever it is and how you come to be in a, in a position where nobody else, no other human being can look at you and not see that full being regardless of whatever else it is around, about you that is, that is commentable upon uh, like the fact that, you know, I have natural hair and Tim doesn't have any hair or whatever it is, um, you know? So sure, it's relevant to Global North and Global South, but it's to me, it's also relevant on, on a universal level as well. And it's trying to figure out what he means by community um, in, in a moral sense that is really, really interesting to me. How, sorry, I'm just, so Cabral, yeah, I think, I mean, I am really cautious about, and I think if Judith is still here, she should know that she has ruined me for other people because I think it's one of the trainings from her, which is that I just try really hard not to confuse thinkers and, and not to, the, the work of comparison is not, um, is not unimportant, but I think in order for comparison to be useful, you have to get really deep into each one and put the right definitions on each one so that you're not mixing things up, right? So like, yeah, Cabral and Fanon and, and, and Biko and Binti, and, Binti and um, a ton of more other people have a lot in common. I, I'm not saying that they don't have any, you know, they have tons in common, especially the ones who are founded on socialist economics. But I'm just focused on figuring out what makes this one thinker him and what makes him distinctive. Can, can I ask you, so in terms of positionality, um, your, your first project took European thinkers and played with their ideas in a Nigerian context. Uh, I'm curious what relevance your own background as an African, but a Nigerian has for understanding Biko and how your perspective might be different from somebody from the UK doing a similar project. Um, well, I can't speak for Somebody, is the person from the UK a, a, a black Brit or a, a white Brit in this theoretical? Anybody? I don't know, I mean, so I tell you one of the ways in which I think my Nigerianness, um, and I think this is a great question by the way, because I think a lot, especially in political theory um, and political philosophy, we come at things uh, pretending we're using like some Jesus, um analysis and like our own and um, you know our own cultural contexts and historical understandings don't matter about you know don't don't influence the answers that we come to and the types of analysis that we do and and the longer i spend in academia the more i realize that that's bollocks um my nigerian one of the things that I, I can see, especially as I've got deeper into my work in African political theory, is that it 
So it's not just my Nigerianness, my Yorubaness. I am a non-Bantu. I, I am one of the dominant, I come from a dominant ethnic group in one of the largest country um, countries in the continent. Um, I am not a Bantu. Um, and I have a cultural heritage that is imposing on others, right? Lots of people are aware of Yoruba religion and Yoruba culture, even if they're not Yoruba and even if they're not Nigerian. Um, and it influences others in multiple ways. And so when I come to these texts, I realize that I have such a keen, it's almost the first thing I notice when I'm critiquing other pieces in the literature is that I, I have such a keen sense of how I am not like this description of the African. Um, and I think that's what makes me land on those critiques so strongly. I don't, I, I, I see that as a plus um, because I see it as something that is, you know, I feel like if I was from a Bantu speaking, um, and it's the same for Uchina, somebody like Uchina Okeja as well, by the way, who is Igbo, Nigerian Igbo, so not a Bantu. I'm from a big enough dominant ethnic group where he can go, I don't know what you lot are talking about, but this doesn't describe my fancy background. Um, but I think it allows us to see the problems when people talk about Africa in these non-specific and non and these ahistorical ways. And but so, but then the problem that it does present is that for people who do come from smaller socio-cultural um, groups who benefit from being classified as Bantu or whatever it is. I, I mean, I would like to be in a discussion with somebody like that. Maybe not so much with somebody from the UK. I'm not sure I'm that interested in what somebody from the UK would do with this, mm -hmm. as opposed to what somebody, you know, what somebody from a small, like a, a Bantu, a Somali <coughs> Bantu, like that's the conversation I would actually like to have. Like mm -hmm. how would a Somali Bantu come at this versus somebody like me? Um, and that would be really interesting for me, but Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I There's a part of me that thinks, so when I was getting into, you know, I was writing this paper for the Journal of Contemporary African Studies and I was doing research on this, where this term, because it's in so much of the literature and I'm just like, what are you talking about? And so I, you know, I did some digging in, in a field that is not mine at all, linguistics, to figure out where all these things are coming from. And of course, even the term Bantu is not our term, right? Like it's, it's these like, you know, European ethno-linguists who go like, oh, these people sound like this and they make clicks and noises. So we're gonna call them Bantus. And so now we've got Africans going, how dare you? I'm a Bantu. And so we've claimed these names that we didn't give ourselves. Um, and, and like we're dying, you know, we're nailing ourselves to a cross over them. Um, and it's just very bizarre to me. So I feel like even within our understandings of how we rebuild our communities, we need to challenge each other. And, and also we need not to see those challenges as problematic, right? We need to see those challenges as just asking us to, to look at things more closely. So Uchina Okeja has this incredible, everybody should go and read it incredible chapter in the recent um, Oxford Handbook of Contemporary Political Theory, of Comparative Political Theory. And it's called Palava and Consensus in something something, but it's the first two words are Palava and Consensus. And he talks about how, you know, a lot of the literature in African political theory has come up with this idea um, that there is this thing as African democracy, this pre-colonial understanding of African democracy that was distinctly African because it was based on consensus. And of course, this is tied to like some of the narrative about Ubuntu and community and all this kind of stuff. And he says, this isn't quite true, right? Like there's, in when you look at this, when you pass out through distinct um, political spaces in pre-colonial Africa, you have different types of deliberative communication. 
and they were not themselves African democracy, but they were the things that made African democracy possible. So you have deliberative spaces in which consensus is prized, but you also have deliberative spaces where palaver is prized, right? Where difference is centered and like figuring out why you are not one of us is the center of that deliberative uh, and it is what makes it what it was what made African democracy in pre the definition of African democracy so and to me because they don't you know, like reading that piece hasn't like destroyed my understanding of, of Africa because it's it's questioned some of the things that I took for granted about pre-colonial Africa that we were all deliberating and like holding hands and going kumbaya and consensusing on everything. But it's made, it's challenged me and it's made it more complex. It's made my history more complex and more complicated. And therefore it's giving me, it's given me a bolder understanding of the, the traditions that, that, that inform my present existence. I think we have maybe time for maybe one more question here from um, Doug Bafford. Let me, um, uh, here we go. Here's the allow to talk button. There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for this fascinating talk. Um, so just as someone who is very much not um, well uh, versed in political theory, uh, I thought it was really great how you made it accessible for, uh, for a, an external audience. Um, so my question is, um, in some ways, asking you to think, um, uh, you know, kind of pursuing the line of, of thinking you were talking about with Biko's relationship to African religion. Um, and so I'm wondering if there's anything else you could say about um, his attitudes towards uh, religion. And again, I mean, this came up uh, a number of times in the talk, you know, when you're thinking about, um, you know, seeing humanity in the image of God. Um, and I'm wondering if his approach to homogenizing um, African religious traditions as seeing it as a kind of unifying pre-Christian um, source. I, I'm wondering if you maybe see some kinds of uh, almost internalizing a Christian monotheism within that. Um, so in other words, you know, where, is, where, where are some of these religious ideologies coming from in his own background, in his um, maybe striving for a pan-African uh, religious tradition, um, or, or just anything else you could say about um, you know, what we can read into this um, this impulse to maybe try to see beyond uh, the boundaries of religious dis uh, difference that do exist on the continent? Yeah, so I think this is a great question. Thank you. I think one of the things that I read uh, in Tabika when he talks about African religion is I don't think he cares that much about African religion um, because he's so, it's, it's probably one of the, um, the areas in which he's the most unspecific. Um, and one of the things that I think he's using it to do because he believes so much in the notion that communities need to be regenerated and need to be um, reimagined in order to give the individual the tools that he or she herself needs to be unaf and this, this issue of being unafraid, being psychologically unafraid is super important for Biko. And so I think that his, his, his use and his idea of African religion is, is doing whatever he thinks will, 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 will add to that communal, will add to that, that pot, that communal pot that gives the individual strength to withstand the trauma that they go, you know, that that are the Black South African in particular, the trauma of being a Black South African in South Africa in the 60s and 70s, and, and you know, onwards through, you know, 90s or whatever. Um, now, the issue of whether he's absorbing a Christian monotheism, it's funny because one of the things he says is he, he so he wants to distinguish between this African religion in which you're only worshiping one God, which is just like factually incorrect, and the way in which you're worshiping one God. So it's really like, it's, it's to, to him, it, 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 
recreation this what he sees as a necessary i don't think that he thinks b he just thinks if we did it like this of course he is super, he is very is, this is his gripe with black bantustan leaders he doesn't want any kind of anything that is going to be a further roadblock to black south africans attaining their freedom and i think for him this this cobbling together of an african religion that is homogenizing but different in some kind of weird unspecific way because we're worshiping our god monday to sunday and white people are only worshiping their god on sunday um is really important but so there's another aspect to this right so <clears throat> he sees god as something <clears throat> he wants black south africans to understand their relationship in the world and their relationship to the humanity in reference to something that is not man made in reference to something and i think maybe it it, may, it could be that african religions don't do that enough for him right because and again i don't want to be be generalizing about something that i don't know as much about but let me take yoruba religions which i do know about which is they don't have this um our gods don't have this um non fully non human quality our gods and goddesses are ethereal but they're not untouchable it's not like the monotheistic god where you're talking to something that has nothing to do with you in terms of form or character right so they're way more relatable they're your friend they you can play with them you can fight with them they smite you when you misbehave you know that kind of thing and i think for him he wants something that is fully um fully non-human fully fully alpha and omega in which black south africans can relate their existence to that thing and know that the reason why one of the reasons why they're humans why they're equal is because of this thing that sits above them and no man can touch that so i think that's one of the reasons that this kind of monolith, i don't see it as him, like unconsciously it's very out of character the absorbing like a european understand is doing that great well thank you so much ella um I think we're, we're just about out of time here, but we, thank you so much for joining us for this uh, rich conversation. Um, I, know I wasn't here when you were here at BU, but you know, from Tim, it, it sounds like it's great to see the, the way that your work is developing. So we're looking forward to seeing this um, in print soon. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Ella. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. This is really great. Thank you.